Well, welcome to Crucial Conversations. I'm Peter. And I'm Kevin. And this is attempt number 15 At to, least. to record tonight's episode, because buttons don't work. So, well, or the person pressing the buttons is not intelligent. I, I wasn't going to say anything about the people. I was just going to blame the buttons. I you was know, you, giving the people an out. Yes, the people <laughs> being this non-competent person. I wasn't going to say Kevin can't push buttons. Yes, that's oh, wait, exactly I, what happened. I just did that, didn't yep. I? Yeah. All right. Okay. But well, we anyways, pressed them now. so the, the buttons have been pressed. We're off and running. Um, we've actually been getting a lot of good questions coming in from uh, several listeners. I was going to say lots of listeners, but several listeners. <laughs> <laughs> follow, follow up to uh, different episodes that we've been covering. So that's fantastic. Please keep those questions coming. We are going to handle them. Um, Today we're not going to, though, because we're kind of following up on another episode that will then lead us into answering some of those questions in future episodes. So we're, we're not ignoring anybody <laughs> or, or anything like that. Um, but if you have a question, since, since I brought up questions, you can send it to questions at crucialproductions.org or head over to our website, crucialproductions.org, and fill out the Ask a Question form. Click the button at the top of the page there. If you appreciate what we do here at Crucial Productions with Crucial Conversations, Bible and Five, all that other stuff that we're involved in, uh, just send us a donation. We appreciate anything you can give to support us after you have supported your local congregation, the church that you are a member of. It's more important for you to support them than us, so we encourage you to do that first, and then if you want to, come back over here. So, Kevin, are you okay? Are you awake? I'm here. I'm, I did that in under two minutes, though. Like you we're did. Doing, we're I'm, doing good. We're kind of getting this down. <laughs> it's good. We're good. So uh, the follow. This episode is a follow up to our uh, episode sixty four. I think it was or sixty five on when the world demands an answer. Uh, this idea of talking, answering the world on current events. Um, so we talked about a couple different kinds of current events. We didn't necessarily talk about specifics and dig deep into them because it was more of a general broad thing but one of one of the difficulties i had as we're talking through that episode as kevin and as you and i have talked about this outside of the context of the episode is we, we recognize the answer we're giving the world is not the answer they want because we're actually pointing them to jesus <laughs> so they have no interest in that that the world doesn't but they're to this episode, I want us to dig a little bit deeper on some of the why that they have no interest. Uh, going beyond the world, our flesh, and the devil, and sin sin itself, which is the obviously big picture answer. But there are some particulars in our current setting, our current cultural context, um, that I think actually feed into this and make it harder to converse with the world on its own terms, uh, if I can put it that way. And we're, we're going to use some vocabulary today that hopefully will do a decent job of defining. Um, I've been doing some reading on this one because as I discovered this particular vocabulary word, which I had heard before, it's like, okay, I'm aware of this. But I was like, wait a minute, this seems to really, to me at least, describe what's going on in a way that's helpful and then thinking through how I'm going to respond to the world because of my understanding now, my better understanding of where they're coming from and how they're framing things. Does that make sense, Kevin? Mm-hmm. I've, I've said a lot of things without actually saying anything, so that was kind of you fun. Pretty much. You're doing well. <laughs> Welcome to modern philosophy. Which is what we're talking about. Today, We're gonna, it's, it, this is going to be a philosophy episode in, in many ways. So what we're talking about today is critical theory. Um, you, you can actually Google that. You'll find a lot of stuff out there on it. Uh, I've actually been reading an article from Stanford University on defining critical theory. Uh, it's quite long. I haven't even made, made all the way through it. I'm just trying to get a handle on what this is. So, Kevin, jump in at any time here as I go through this. But the, the basic dynamics of critical theory, and I'm not a philosophy major. I'm going to put that right out there. So those of you who are listening who are philosophy people, please feel free to engage us on this. <laughs> and me especially as I'm attempting to define and work through this. Um, because I, I value that feedback in helping me refine my thoughts on this. So it, critical theory is, it's, it's a philosophical 
concept that's developed over time. I mean, as all philosophies do, they, they arise in a particular time period based on particular things going on around them and the downfall of previous theories that didn't quite work. Well, here's a new one. Let's see if this kind of describes our world a little bit better. Uh, Kevin, you and I have talked about modernism and postmodernism a little bit. Critical theory actually flows out of what the postmodern movement. It's, it's not a modern movement. It's definitely more in, in the vein of postmodernism. But we've talked about, before we go too far, when we talk about philosophy here on this podcast, one of the things we're trying to intentionally do is point out how none of these philosophies, modernism, postmodernism, or today critical theory, is going to be what we would consider a, this just describes everything and it's amazing and this is the way scripture talks about things. No, that's that's not the way it's going to work because these are all things that humans have come up with using our own reason to describe the world around us. Um, and because they are human constructs, our, our best efforts at understanding how the world works, how, how we think, how we operate, how we interact with the world around us, they're, they're going to be flawed. They're, they're not, in some cases, more flawed than others, uh, more readily um, susceptible to the evils of our sinful nature than others. Um, and in other cases, they'll hit on things that's like, wow, that really sounds like what scripture says about that. And it'll be kind of close, but it's not, none of these are going to line up with scripture lockstep. That's just not, not how it works. You can't take philosophy and do that. <coughs> Excuse me. I don't have COVID. I just talked a lot at once and now I'm coughing. Um, for anybody worried and listening. <laughs> We're more than six feet apart. It's okay. Once again, that river thing we got going on between yeah. us there. <laughs> yeah. So critical theory is, is another philosophy in this vein, where as we talk about it, I, I think the reason I latched onto this is because as it's described, there are some things that jumped out at me where I was like, oh, I could see why that would sound attractive to a Christian, where a Christian would hear that aspect of it and think, wow, that's a really good thing. I, I think that works with our, our faith. Um, and then other things that will jump out where it's like, whoa, that, that doesn't work at all. But the problem is the way it's presented in our culture today, I think, is framed more in the area of those things that look very compatible. They sound very compatible. You maybe even use vocabulary that sounds quite biblical. But if you take a deeper look at it, it's quite not. <laughs> um, Kevin, jump in here because I'm starting to cough a lot with all the talking. Yeah, so what happens is is philosophies and philosophers really try to look at the world and make sense of it often by looking at individual occurrences and then trying to explain it with either how that intersects with grand narratives or how it contradicts the accepted grand narrative. And that sounds kind of weird and esoteric, but it's not. It basically means this. When I'm as a philosopher looking at the world, whatever my philosophy is needs to be able to explain the world, whether that's the world as I perceive it, or whether that explains that my perceptions are incorrect about the world. So philosophy looks at things and from observation, from, from logic and thinking, um, they take observations and they try to systematize things. They try to say, okay, these ideas explain what we see or what we experience. And as we move into in and out of philosophical people and movements and thoughts, there's always, and, and this is true whether you're an atheist or, or a theist, there's always some aspect of God or divine or spirituality in philosophy because it's, it's inescapable, is that part of philosophy is to explain why humans do what humans do and why the world works the way it works. And that always ends up intersecting with some kind of thing that's larger than individual people mm -hmm. so we start looking at structures we start looking at overall movements and reasons and we look at um maybe god is a reason that things happen maybe society is a reason things happen maybe 
evolution is a reason things happen happen maybe um politics or or the view of the liberation of man or the and and what happens is is philosophy tends to get very 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 um intellectual and very removed from real life Um, a lot of philosophers are accused of developing these systems that work perfectly in a textbook and in a classroom but have no no appreciable pragmatic reality they're not practical at all they're just theories okay that's a fantastic introduction to where we're going to go with critical theory because one of the uh, uh, unique identifiers of critical theory is that it's practical or or it's attempting to be practical so th- this is you're going to hear a lot of Karl Marx stuff if you're looking up critical theory on the internet you're going to hear Marx's name thrown around and one of one of his things is that philosophy as as Kevin just described it is kind of pointless if all we're doing is just describing things this is kind of silly that's my own <laughs> layman's uh version of of Marx um so he said, no, we, it also needs to be practical. And where critical theory comes into this is, is that practical side where it, it criticizes, it, cri- it criticizes social constructs, it criticizes society with an eye towards reform. So you actually need to change. So it's not just a descript- description of here's where we are. It's also a, okay, let's make value judgments on whether where we are is good or bad and we need to move forward from there. We need to move towards reform to improve where we are into something better. And the the big distinction that happens with critical theory is you basically divide society, I don't know if that's the right word, into two categories. There's the oppressors and there's the oppressed. And those are the two primary categories that you end up working with. It's it's power. Uh, power dynamics are a huge part of this. Who has the power? Who doesn't have the power? But you you can um, who is enslaved and who is free? But you can kind of sum that up in oppressor and oppressed. And the reason I found this helpful in in understanding at least a little bit more about critical theory is because when you listen to the news today, when you listen to our culture talking, when you look on social media, you'll begin to see these two categories very clearly delineated. There are the oppressors, they have the power. They are the, they are the ones who uh, hold that power and wield that power. They will do whatever they can to keep it. And you have the oppressed, uh, those who do not have power. Uh, the oppressors have a voice. The oppressed do not have a voice. There's There's lots of different dynamics that come into this, but then the bottom line becomes, if you are the oppressor, all you can do is listen to the oppressed or make sure you do whatever you can to give up your power to relinquish it so that the oppressed can have it. If you're the oppressed, you need to be given a voice, you, you need to be listened to um, so, that you're, so that you can have some powers, you can gain power. Uh, uh, the power is such a huge, I mean, it, it's a very technical word, uh, um, so I might be using it a little too loosely here. Um, but the fact remains that you're, you're, when you have this dichotomy that's set up, because that's what critical theory ends up setting up, and it goes into all sorts of different directions. We're not going to dig deep into it, but Kevin, you and I were talking about, you know, there's critical race theory, there's critical gender theory, there's feminism theory, there's queer theory, all these different um, demographics that get well, okay, th- that get so, talked about. Yeah. So the reason the reason these things all get talked about in critical theory is that, along with the the premise of oppressors and oppressed, is the goal of mankind. And, oh, and the, yeah. The goal of mankind is to be liberated, to be free. Is this where so, liberation liberation theology does that come into this somewhere? Right. Too? So okay. so one of the products of, of this theory is is actually liberation theology that, that came about in late sixties, early seventies, especially in regards to race theory in the United States. Um, Black liberation theology is actually the name of a book. And the the reason this is important is because when the philosophical goal of mankind is to be free is to be liberated 
then this is what leads to the identification of humanity into two basic identified groups. You are either the oppressed or the oppressors. And your goal is to be free. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what Peter's getting at in this, is that when, when you see it in that lens, you start dividing societies or cultures or peoples into these groups of, are you oppressed? And if so, you are oppressed by an oppressor. And then what's happened is critical theory says that these, these groups of oppressors and oppressed are actually intrinsic in the fabric of our society. So that there are people who belong to the group of oppressors simply by the nature of their being. Mm -hmm. and, and once you get... Once you identify the group that oppresses, you are part of that group simply by being, by having the qualities of that group. And if you are an oppressed, if a certain group is oppressed, then you are a part of that group simply by having those qualities. So, so one place that that is, um, that we can talk about without a whole lot of controversy in this is that male and female. So by definition, in, in this theory, we're not saying we agree or disagree, according, according in to this critical according theory, critical yeah. theory, males are oppressors. It's a patriarchal society. It has been for, you know, all of Western society, and therefore males are oppressors. And and females are the oppressed. And we can look at this and um even the words like mankind, humankind, who for us men are our salvation. And mm -hmm. we say, see, that's all this systemic oppression of males over females. And you'll read this a lot. People say, well, the Bible was written by males. That's why it's male dominated. That's why there's male clergy. That's why it's male this and male that, right? And so you'll have books these days that try to fight that by saying, oh, we're going to tell the story of the women of the Bible. Um, there's even a, a popular website that, that claims to be a conservative Christian website, but is continually saying we need more voices of more women in the church <laughs> to stop this, this male oppression. And again, we're not, we're not wanting to talk about that issue in particular. I'm just saying that's an illustration of this oppressor and oppressed reality. Now, the problem is, go ahead, Peter, did you have a point? <laughs> I did. I was going to say, th this is, as we talk about this, I started off by saying some of this sounds Christian and and attractive, but what you just described to at least to a conservative Christian like myself, I'm like, wait a minute, how how does that sound attractive? But here's the thing, when when the categories are oppressor and oppressed, most Christians are going to immediately think, oh, well, a, being oppressed is bad. I mean, that's not biblical. Scripture is all about justice and mercy and love. So, being oppressed, well, that's a bad thing. I don't want to be part of the oppressors group. Um, and if I see somebody who's in the oppressed group, I need to do what I can to to help them, to serve them. That's what loving my neighbor means. So uh, for a Christian to hear some of this, I, I, I can understand where it would sound biblical on one level because you're thinking in those terms. But Kevin, you and I know, as, as we've had this conversation many times, especially on this podcast, you can't just take contemporary words and their meanings and then go find those words in scripture and assume that it's the same thing, that it's even talking about the same thing, much less means the same thing. And so this is yet one more area where this initially sounds like, oh, this is something Christians should get on board with, but it's not talking about it in the same way. So yeah, continue now. <laughs> so. So now the problem is, and we're just gonna, we're still just kind of reviewing terms. We're going to get to what Peter just addressed in a second because that's going to kind of be the where we lead in all this. But just to continue the idea of critical theory and oppressors and oppressed, what we get to then is the problem of intersectionality. Okay, intersectionality is when in one person they belong to the uh, both an oppressor and an oppressed group. Okay, so now in Western society, especially in America, whites are oppressors. White people belong to the group of oppressor. 
and minorities are oppressed. That's critical theory. That's what they say. That's just the definition. Okay? Yeah. That's kind of a given definition. Yeah. Um, so now what happens is a white woman is both an oppressor because she's white and an oppressed because she's woman. Mm -hmm. And then if that white woman happens to be in a field that is dominated by males, she's also oppressed because of the minority presence of females in that field, mm -hmm. right? So now you have the intersectionality in that person of oppressor and oppressed in one person. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> this can even happen in a white male. It's very hard for us to have any oppressed in us, but it could happen. There could be a white male. By the way, white male is kind of the definition of oppressor in this yeah, whole theory. Yeah. So Peter and I are right out, by the way. Just in case you guys were wondering. <laughs> well, I, I think we're the out. one that, the we're, one that we're comes, just oppressors. That's yeah, the one that would come to mind that might cause intersectionality in a white male would be if they were gay. Yeah, exactly. So that's that, exactly that's, that's what like happens. The only so now, things. so now that's exactly right, and that's where most of us would would um, even hear this language, is that a, a white man who I, who will use their terms self identify self identifies as gay or and and not using that as a slang term that they would sure. say that word the technical themselves. Technical term, yeah. Um, would homosexual or transgender or confused or whatever they want to call themselves queer whatever right yeah whatever the term is whatever the term they choose to use and i'm not i'm not saying those to to make fun of them i'm tr i'm trying to use the right. terms that that these these theories actually use and so if if a male a, a white male who that's the definition of a oppressor is then identifying themselves as a homosexual now they are intersectional oppressed and oppressor and that intersectionality is is kind of this tension that we live in, and um, that's that's part of what this theory works on is is kind of identifying these intersectionality issues, and then trying to bring about. Remember, all this is based on the idea that we want philosophy that actually brings about change. Yeah. We don't want philosophy that's just kind of theoretical. We want it to move so, forward. So the goal is to stop the oppression. Yeah. Okay. Now remember, this is not an individual case. This is not Peter oppressing me. This is this is based on groups, oppressors and oppressed. So what that means is is that oppressors are oppressors because of their history of oppression. And all the history of that group being in the position of being oppressors is now lumped on all the people in that category presently as oppressors and they need to repent of it. They need to feel bad for it. They need to apologize for it. And they need to do reparations. They need to fix it. They find they need to find some way to, um, yeah, we're, that's where it gets a little sticky. We're, we're intentionally not using the word forgiveness in the right. context of this. Because we're going to get not, to that. That's, that's not, not part of this. the goal. Yeah. So if, if people are sitting, if you're sitting there thinking, well, forgiveness, they're asking for forgiveness. No, no. No, they're that's not. That's actually not part of this. <laughs> um, and, well, we'll get to that. <laughs> and another part of this that you'll hear a lot is that no effort that has been made in the past makes any difference because you're still oppressing. It simply doesn't matter. I, yeah. I just heard yesterday someone saying that nothing has changed in 600 years. I read an article that said that. Yeah. And it's like, and a lot of people say 400 years, going to go back to 1619. And, you know, that's that's just simply not true. A lot has changed. The one I said but was 150 years. But, right. <laughs> the and one then, I was reading. Yeah. Whatever, wherever Depending they on what to they're go talking about. To, right. Yep. Yep. So, so. The issue, and, and, and again, we're not we're not putting people down. We're just trying to expose kind of the, the presuppositions behind these, this language. And then we're going to spend some time looking at it pretty soon from Scripture's point of yes. view. So, so what, what happens then is, is that anybody who belongs to the group of oppressor is guilty of everything that has been done by the group that's labeled oppressor. And 
there it, there has been no change in history because oppression is still going on. The only change that matters is the end of oppression. Yeah, you, you start with the premise that oppression exists just a priori. That's like your assumption. Right. The your oppression assumption. exists. Here it is. And now we're going to begin to identify it and then we're divide everybody up into categories. So you're, I mean, this is an important point that where you start actually matters. And the starting point is oppression exists and we need to change it. And, and everything you do as an oppressor contributes to oppression. Everything. <laughs> Even if you think it's trying to end oppression, I'm, you're I'm simply la- doing it as an oppressor, and therefore it is more oppression. I'm laughing at the hopelessness of that statement. That's And this <laughs> is like, the problem. Wh- what do I do with that? <laughs> you, you, you can't do anything but admit that you're an oppressor. And this is yeah. this is really where we're now getting to in our society is, and and the one reason we're bringing this up is because this is not a non-church movement. We now have public people in the Christian Church, in the American Christian Church, publicly repenting of being white, publicly repenting of being part of the oppressor group, publicly lamenting before God on YouTube and on their websites, having a bunch of pastors lamenting this this systemic racism that we're all guilty of going back hundreds of years, publicly going before God and and repenting of um, literally being part of an oppressor an oppressor group. Mm-hmm. I'd, I'd even talking about this makes me very uncomfortable because I know by virtue of me being a white male, I will be heard by, I will be heard as an oppressor. There, yeah. There is no other way that somebody who identifies as oppressed can hear what I say on this podcast as anything other than an oppressor speaking down speaking. to the oppressed. Right. And it, so, it's... It's, yeah. <laughs> so let's transition a little bit. So so let's be let's be totally blunt about what we believe and and what I mean this is a podcast so this is what we believe. Um And it's our podcast so we can say what we believe, we right? We can say it. <laughs> and I have I have no no hesitation, no fear, no shame in 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 admitting what I believe. And Yeah. I believe that the scriptures teach us that humanity is created by God and that God's love for all humans, every single one of them is defined by his gift of his son, Jesus Christ. And this is love, not that we love God, but he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And in first John chapter, that was first John four and first John two, it says he is the propitiation for our sins, but not just for our sins, but the sins of the whole world. Hmm. I don't see any, difference there the only thing i see is that humans need god's intervention to be saved and he did it you you don't have the categories of oppressed and oppressor in scripture Hmm. it doesn't speak that way not in not anthropologically yes that's uh yeah that's what i was trying to say (laughs) okay so now i know there are a lot of people going uh uh Okay, we know the passages. Trust us. We've yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're not unaware <laughs> of the passages, um, but this is the problem: is is now all of a sudden we're into the the method of how you're going to read the Bible. Are you going to start reading the Bible to see if the word oppressed or oppressor or outsider or um, to minority s- or to see groupings. if you can find these categories? If in you scripture. find these words yeah. or categories or things that seem to appear parallel yeah. in scripture. And this is what we really need to address in the in the, the podcast is that this is the reason we're doing the podcast right. on this topic <laughs> is that this has this this critical theory is actually becoming a hermeneutic. Now there there's a fancy word Yay! for it right there. I don't know what Herman has to do with That's this. That's not my friend but, Herman yeah. in his Udix or something like that. It's not a <laughs> rock band. Um, hermeneutics is really the theory of how do you read and interpret a text and usually when we're talking about it obviously we're thinking about how do you read and interpret scripture yeah so critical theory is actually entering into the church now and changing the way we read the bible 
Now, some people might say, oh, good, that's part of being woke. You got to learn how to read yeah, the Bible this way or something. Yeah, we're reforming. This is Great. part we're, of we're, reforming it. We're this growing. is good. Yeah. Great. The problem is that's not the right way to read scripture. Yeah. It's not the way the church has ever read the scripture, and it's not the way scripture itself teaches us to read scripture. I say it's not how scripture presents itself to be read. Right. So yeah. when we start asking questions about how to read scripture, if you don't know this answer from the our podcast yet, go back and re-listen to all the episodes <laughs> because the interpretive key to scripture is God's definitive action to save my, mankind in his son, Jesus Christ. As it says in Luke 24, the law of Moses, the prophet and the Psalms are all written about the Christ, his suffering and his death. You know, Paul says this is the first importance that Christ died in the course of the scriptures was raised again. Paul says, I know nothing among you but Christ and him crucified, right? John says, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, by believing have life in his name. Yes, that's for the gospel of John, but it also tells us why he wrote this scripture. It's, it isn't mm -hmm. to talk, talk to about oppression. It isn't to talk about saving those who are seen as outsiders and bringing them in. That, yeah. that is not the point of scripture. And yes, you can find stories that seem to have that thread in them. But that's not the interpretive matrix that even those stories that we read through. And this is one thing I really want to just kind of say and let people think about is that when the Bible talks about outsiders and insiders, right? This is a big thing right now. Outsiders and insiders, oppressors and oppressed. The, the question is not whether or not those groups exist. The question is in what context, meaning outside of whom or what? Yeah. Oppressed by whom or what? And this is the same thing with aliens and foreigners and immigrants. As we start using all these passages where we find alien or, or foreigner and we say, ooh, look, look, look. But the answer is no, no, no. They're not aliens and foreigners to America in the Old Testament. They're aliens and foreigners to Israel. And what you're going to find real quick is that people are playing fast and loose with these texts and they're just taking Israel and pretending that that is parallel to America. Sometimes without even knowing that's what they're doing. Right. Without even thinking about it. Yeah. <laughs> and and I'm here to tell you, that's a major mistake in how to read the Bible. The, the Mormons did that. Wanna, that's, yeah, you whoops. got a whole religion based off of that now. <laughs> well, and you have a whole branch of, of American Christianity that does that. Yeah. Um, Premillennial yeah. dispensationalism does it all the time. That's actually their premise, is that America is kind of the fulfillment of Israel or there's another country that's going to be a fulfillment. We got to go figure that one out, right? That's now yeah. in Zionism and those kinds of issues. But see, this is the first question you have to ask is, is just because you found the word doesn't mean it's actually addressing the same situation. Say, that, Israel, say that again, because that's easy to miss. Just because you find the same word in scripture that we're using now doesn't mean it applies to the same situation. And yeah, <laughs> Yeah. So, so do the minor prophets talk about oppressing people and how that's against God's will? Yes. But it's not talking about people in a political reality. It's talking about people within Israel. It, he doesn't say to the Babylonians, stop oppressing the poor Babylonians. No, he's addressing his people. He's addressing the church. And in the church, we agree there is no room for oppression. There is no room for um, ego. There is no room for agenda. There is no room for boasting. There's no room for pride. And that is how the church is to live out their life in Christ, is to love one another as God has loved us and to serve one another. And that's right. And we would also agree then that the church is to treat their neighbor the same way mm -hmm. in service and in love. Absolutely, no doubt about it. But that's a far cry from saying that everybody who is in the white male category is an oppressor and everybody that is oppressed by them are the people in scripture who need to be rescued. That is, that is not what's going on at all. As a matter of fact, if you want to read scripture about oppression and oppressed and justice and all those kind of things, you're going to find yourself face to face with a God who is actually demanding justice, not between humans, 
but between the Almighty God and his creature. And that's the most important thing that's going astray in this entire conversation is that sin is no longer defined as man before God, but it's simply being defined as man to other groups of humans. So now we have one group of humans sinning as another group of human, and the point of Scripture is to make those two groups equal. Well, that's not correct. And one of the things that you said as we were talking through this is in that system, humans— are the solution to the human problem. Exactly. It's it's it gets even worse. It's that we're right. actually the solution to our problem and there you can't get that from scripture. I mean, if no. you're going to read scripture honestly, e- even uh, let me say it this way, even even if you don't buy into our hermeneutic about Jesus and how you should read scripture, it's still very difficult to read scripture and think that humans are the solution to the sin problem. Exactly. And, and so, so there's two major problems, and they're both actually two sides of the same coin, which is our sin problem, according to critical theory and what's going on in our world right now, is because we've offended other people. And it's not individual. It's, it's classes of people. It's groups of people, right? Yeah. So it's Groups systemic. of people against other groups, groups of, of people. people. Right. Yeah. And so it's not that I've offended you and need your forgiveness and need to repent before God. It's that I belong to this group of people that's wrong because I've oppressed other groups of people and somehow that's my sin. Well, that's just not what scripture is about at all. And then what happens is because that's what we want scripture to be about, we start reinterpreting even Jesus. So now I'm hearing people say that Jesus overthrowing the, the tables in the temple is an example of violent protest. Yeah. And that that makes it okay to protest. Because he, um, he, he challenged the authorities. He challenged right, the, the oppressors, oppressors as right. one who was oppressed or representing the marginalized the and the oppressed. Therefore, right. because he did it in this way, it's legitimate. And he did it violently. He did it violently with whips beating people. It's now legitimate for the oppressed today to respond in the same way to their oppressors as a, okay. as a class, as a group. Right. And you can see why that reading makes sense right you can right there you kind of explained it there you go yeah however that wasn't what jesus was doing at all (laughs) as a matter of fact it's almost the opposite of what he was doing he was actually pointing to himself as the fulfillment of the temple and he was pointing ahead to his death as the actual removal of sin from israel See, and this is the problem is we're looking all this to justify our actions or to condemn the way that certain groups of people have treated other groups of people, but we're missing the point of the text. The point of the text is not about people oppressing other people. It's about sin killing us and Jesus rescuing us. And mm-hmm. part of that rescue is the cleansing of of God's holy temple because God's temple is where God meets with mankind. And they had made the place where God meets with man, not a place where man goes to worship God and to receive from God his gifts and his sacraments, but it was a place to make a buck. That's what Jesus was overthrowing. See, it's not about classes. It's not about oppression. It's not about, you know, the people in power and the people not in power. No, it was simply cleansing of the temple. And if, and if you don't understand that, this is actually the point of Yom Kippur in the Old Testament too. Look at the look at the traditions and the rites around the Day of Atonement in the Old Testament. Part of it was the cleansing of the tabernacle itself, because the the people's sins were literally making the house of God unclean. So so this cleansing of the temple is not some kind of violent reaction against some oppressive group. I just think about the terminology that you're using and how it's defined according to Scripture. Atonement, cleansing, um, cleaning out, clearing out. The, the, as, well, spe- the, the cleansing and atonement especially, those are specifically referring to sin. So you mm-hmm. can't just take those, rip them from the context of Scripture and say, no, it actually applies to what's going on now. It's kind of, I, I, I almost feel like if, if we were... Uh, 
doing playing theology games. One of them would be mm -hmm. words that sound biblical but aren't. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I, cleansing. Hey, that sounds biblical. Yes, there's a biblical definition. But hey, the way we're using it over here, that's not biblical at all. That's that's right. kind of what the exercise we've been doing in this episode is to words that sound biblical, but they actually aren't because you're using them totally different than Scripture does. So ironically, for for those of us in our theological um, circle, you would say, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, confessional theologians, those who hold to the inerrancy of Scripture, a high view of Scripture, a high Christology, mm -hmm. orthodoxy, those kinds of things. Um, this reading of Scripture is actually the result of higher criticism and historical criticism of the late 18th century, early 19th century. This is what led to this reading of Scripture with oppressed and oppressors. This is not a conservative movement at all in scriptural reading. As a matter of fact, this is the product of removing God from Scripture and making it simply a book about humans interacting with each other. Um, You're saying the critical fact, theory thing that we're talking about? Well, the way that you see groups of oppressed and okay, oppressors yeah. in Scripture. And, and critical theory is actually bringing this back to the fore as a popular way of reading scripture and conservatives are embracing this without realizing that this is, okay. this has yeah, never been an orthodox way to read scripture. Yeah. We, as a we matter of fact, we knew a hundred years ago, this was a problem, right? We knew this now is not the right way to read scripture. It's sneaking back in. <laughs> so, so we've said a lot and, and I know it's a lot to think about, but I, I do want to make sure that, that people don't misunderstand us. And I, I just hate the fact that we have to do this, but I do think we need to, Yeah, is that we are not in, any way saying that we're for racism we're not for any kind of mistreatment of any human based on any kind of prejudice or or reason in that person um we are called to love period yeah we are called to love as god loves and people have asked me a lot during this well what's your reaction and my reaction is very simple and i mean this that we are called to see each and every person as God sees them. Yeah. That means I am not allowed to judge you in a way that God isn't judging you. So this is important. Why does the Lord's prayer tell us to, that we must forgive? It's because God is forgiving that person. If God is forgiving that person and I'm not, I am saying to God that my judgment and my standards are higher than his. Right? Mm -hmm. That's a problem. Yeah. I am not allowed to see a person differently than God sees them. That's a sin. Yeah. Right? So this is important for this discussion, which is we look at every person on the face of the earth as someone for whom Christ has died. We're, we're also not saying that racism doesn't exist. We, we know that people hate other people in that way. I know myself that I have, I struggle with sin and there have probably been times where I have fallen into that sin as well. So we're, we're not saying that these sins don't exist. What we're saying is scripture offers, Jesus offers a different solution. We're, we're, what we're pointing out here is the world has set up an alternate solution to this problem that isn't actually a solution at all because it's not right. found in Christ. Exactly. And so we're trying to point you guys back to, no, there there are problems in our mm -hmm. world. There are serious, major issues. They're all a result of sin. Yes. And there's one answer to that, and that answer right. is always Jesus. And, and Peter said it, and, and we'll just say it to make sure nobody misunderstands us, Racism is a sin. Yes. <laughs> because it is looking at a person in a way that God does not teach us to see people. Yeah. Period. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you're... It just doesn't matter how you go about this. If you are looking at a person and thinking thoughts about them, other than the thoughts that God would have you think about them, you are sinning. We've ended up focusing on racism at the end, but this goes to any of those categories that we talked right. about at the beginning, the critical theory categories, how it subdivides. If you're thinking about any of those categories in a way that God doesn't, you're, you're sinning. I'm right. sinning. I have done that. 
I have committed so, those sins. I but I need forgiveness for those. I don't right. <laughs> that's in all of this. We said we'd finally get to that. Forgiveness in Christ is actually the answer. So let's let's run to one that's really really touchy, but not the current debate. Well, it is the current debate, but it's not the major one. Homosexuality. Yeah. Homosexuality is a sin according to the Bible. There, there's just no two ways about it. You can you can change scripture if you want to, but you have to change it to make it not a sin in scripture. It right. is a sin in scripture. Yeah. Period. That's just that's just life. So, I have a good friend who's a homosexual. Am I supposed to hate that person? Is that how God wants me to see that person? Hmm. To hate them because of this sin in their life? To look down on them as worse than you, as a worse sinner? Or, or to treat them as less than human or to right. disparage them or to wish ill for them. that All of that is antithetical to who we are in Christ. Yeah. God loves that person so much that he sent his son to die for that person. How about if I learn to love the same way? How about if I learn to love that person in Christ? Now, yes, part of that love is going to be talking about the truthfulness of sin, need of repentance. Um, I don't want to bring this up publicly, but I'm a sinner. And the people who love me sometimes love me enough to say, um, it's time to repent. Yeah. Like I actually drive every, every week to a place where my pastor tells me I better repent or else. Yep. Like literally. <laughs> he says it in front of a whole group of people and I, okay, you're right. And, and. And this is part of the point is that none of us are righteous. No one is righteous, not even one, save our Lord Jesus Christ. And and what we do with this current situation, all the things we're facing, is that we want to learn to see people as God sees people. Yeah. In his image, because of the death and resurrection of Christ, beloved by God. How do you learn to love your serve your neighbor? That's the question. Learn to see them as God sees them. Learn to see them in Christ. That's that's the crucial conversation. Um, and hopefully, as you guys have listened today, you like like Kevin and I, who constantly struggle and are still learning to do this, um, seeing people in that way as well. Let's not look at ourselves and look at each other, but let's look to Christ um, and who he is and what he's done. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Kevin, any uh, any additional things you want to say at the end here? We really want to hear from you on this and like everything else. And um, yeah, it's it as always, keep reading your scriptures and keep finding in them Christ and him crucified. And, and let that be really the way that you interpret the world is, is how does God see all this? What yeah. how does how does this all fit in the death and resurrection of Christ as God's definitive action to save mankind. Excellent. Well, once again, if you have questions, send them to questions at crucialproductions.org. Go to our website, uh, crucialproductions.org, and at the top there's the Ask a Question button. We would love for this podcast to continue to be a dialogue between us and you rather than us just telling you things us? so <laughs> <laughs> please keep sending in those questions and uh, the next couple weeks we're looking forward to answering the ones you guys have sent in thanks a lot see you next time see ya